So good day everyone uh, and uh, thank you so much for attending this webinar uh, today morning. My name is Murli, uh, one of the core members of Purple Synapse with a few years of cybersecurity experience. Uh, so Purple Synapse uh, uh, located in Bengaluru, which is our world-class cybersecurity research, innovation and uh, attack simulation maps, also provides the red and blue teaming skills and trainings. So in order to secure the information systems of our customers, so we provide uh, all this cyber range and cultural range labs for the training modules. So this webinar is happening in association with KTEC. KTEC is Cyber Security Center of Excellence, a really a good initiative from Karnataka government to spread cyber security awareness and uh, innovations. So as you guys know, this webinar is uh, all about providing you basic awareness of uh, buffer overflow attack. So, so guy who is uh, sitting next to me uh, is Sai Kalash, is going to present you with this uh, webinar. And uh, about uh, Sai Kalash, he is uh, one of the security researcher and certified ethical hacker and uh, a penetration tester. So Sai Kalash, uh, welcome to this webinar. And uh, yeah, you can take the control for now. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, hope you're having a great morning and hope you had some breakfast for this session so that we can start and uh, uh, start off. Uh, so should I be waiting for a couple of minutes or should I start? Very late. You can. Okay. So uh, I'll be starting off. Uh, just um, it'd be great if you can, uh, you guys can, uh, uh, ping me in the group chat if you can if I'm really audible or if I need to alter my tone in any way Anyone um, The rest of you guys if it's fine you can just uh, go ahead and ping me in the group chat if that be that'd be great so that I, I I'm sure that everyone can hear me and I can continue with this tone Okay, thank you. Great. Uh, so let's uh, let's get started. So um, I'll be basically uh, giving a basic uh, concept, uh, like I'll be explaining the basic concept of stack-based buffer overflows. Uh, so what can you expect from this webinar? Uh, you can expect a basic cybersecurity awareness as to how buffer overflow attacks are exploited in uh, in real how. Uh, the concept of uh, stack-based uh, buffer overflows. Uh, using stack-based buffer overflows for safe return pointer override exploitation. This I'll be explaining more in detail as we go through the practical demonstration um, in the webinar. And uh, uh, an introduction into the world of exploit development. So how basically, uh, how we start off the journey of exploit development, I'll be uh, Sharing you few, uh, I'll be sharing with you a few of the steps as to how exploit development actually goes about in various phases, from the initial exploit to the, to an exploit that we can fire and uh, get the shell directly. Uh, a small disclaimer: uh, this webinar does not con uh, cover the concepts of uh, modern uh, modern modern uh, compile time protections like DEP, ASLR, or Stack Canaries. Uh, these uh, these are modern modern uh, compile time protections that make exploit development tricky in a way and we'll have to party like it's the early 2000s uh, um, to get this uh, to learn the basic concept first and then we can move uh, ahead okay so what is a, a, a buffer overflow a buffer overflow occurs basically in a situation where a program or a process uh, it can be an executable and application attempts to write more data to a fixed length block of memory. So we have a fixed length block of memory and a program or a process tries to write, uh, write more data than, it, than the memory allocated to it. That's when um, the buffer overflow happens. So an example of data stored in buffers are login credentials or the host name for an FTP server. This for example, when a username with a maximum of eight bytes is expected, but a username of 10 bytes is given 
and the buff n is written to the buffer in this case the buffer is exceeded by 2 bytes and an overflow will occur when it's not prevented from occurring so what uh, what can uh, an attacker do in this situation and an, an attacker can leverage this uh, to craft a uh, input uh, to craft an input to an application which can cause the application to execute arbitrary code this can also lead to the compromise of the machine if arbitrary code is executed um, what what are the impacts of a buffer overflow attack it can lead to uh, like i said remote code execution it can lead to privilege escalation in a bad situation and it can also lead to denial of service here uh, in other ways uh, why does a buffer overflow attack occur? So this can happen due to bad programming from the develop uh, from the developers of the application, and also can happen due to poor input sanitization given to the application. These are the few reasons why a buffer overflow can occur. Uh, so let's uh, move on to the next slide. So uh, what are the, uh, I'll be showing you a practical demonstration of a buffer overflow uh, after this uh, mini small presentation that I have put together. Uh, what you'll be needing is the target we'll be um, trying to exploit is Minishare 4.1.4.1. Uh, it's a free float FTP server that, allow, uh, that is running on HTTP port 80. That allow us that allows us to upload files or download uh, download files from the server, and is um, is a basic FTP server running on port 80. Uh, the tools that we we'll need is uh, any Windows operating system will do for this demonstration because we are uh, disabling uh, DEP and a ASLR in any case. So any Windows operating system should do the trick. Um, along with that, we'll need Immunity Debugger. Uh, this is a debugger uh, to which we attach the executable to study it in memory. Uh, sorry. Um, and we'll need a plugin called Mona.py, which is uh, built by the Coraland team and is available on GitHub. Uh, this is a script that will help us locate few instructions uh, within the executable that uh, I'll be discussing more in detail through the practical demonstration. And any flavor of GNU Linux will be good for this. Um, to good will be good to perform this uh, attack, like the scripting and the exploitation part, along with the Metasploit framework. Uh, so I know. Um, so let's move on. Uh, here we have the immunity deb debugger interface, uh, which we'll be seeing a lot through the practical demonstration. So I thought it'd be great if you guys get comfortable with the interface at first. Uh, so at the top here, we have the execution uh, controls. Uh, this allows the uh, whichever process we attach to it, it allows the process to be restarted, closed, run, or paused. Uh, and also it allows uh, to navigate using this button here. We can navigate to a particular memory address. Okay, so this is the dissembler section, which is the main CPU section and is important. Uh, shows It shows the contents of a binary file as assembly instructions, as we can see here. The next instruction to be uh, executed by the CPU is always highlighted. As we can see, uh, this instruction is highlighted as it's the next one to be executed by the CPU. Uh, this is the register section, which shows the current state of the CPU registers. The most important ones being EAX through EIP, uh, which are always present at the top of the pane. Um, the next uh, area is the dump, uh, which, I, uh, which is this uh, lower left-hand side section. Uh, the dump shows the contents of the processes, memory space uh, as a binary dump, basically your ones and zeros and can be useful for uh, examining regions of memory. This can be very useful for examining the regions of memory to see um, if we write anything like any shell code to this memory, how, how, it, looks in, um, how it looks in the memory. Uh, this is the stack area, which shows the current state of the stack with the top of the stack highlighted always. This, uh, as you can see, the top of the stack is always highlighted and um, this is uh, when we push something onto the stack, it keeps growing in this direction and the top of the stack is highlighted. 
uh, and this track goes downward in this case. Uh, the command input, uh, which is this area here, um, is used to interact, basically interact with Immunity Debugger and its plugins like Mona.py uh, in a command driven fashion, basically like your term Linux or Windows terminal as um, it's the same thing, but you use this to interact with Immunity. Um, the status bar should, uh, shown down. Uh, which shows the various status messages like if uh, if we crash this application using our script uh, the the exception or will be raised here in and the status will be shown here and the process state basically your uh, bottom right which is at the corner uh, this shows whether the process is basically in a running state or in a, a pause state so let's uh, move on to the next slide okay uh, so these are the various uh, phases of buffer overflow that I'll be demonstrating uh, through the uh, through the practical demonstration. Um, I'll be going um, through each of these in detail and will be explaining to you from how we built the basic skeleton code to crash the application. Uh, I'll be going till the point where we exploit and um, gain full control of the target system. So I'll be going through uh, the full phase in detail. So let's uh, jump on to the practical uh, demonstration. So I'll be basically showing this practical demonstration on uh, VMware, uh, where I have a Kali Linux uh, machine and a Windows machine. This Windows machine can be of any, um, any operating system from your seven to anything. You just need to have DEP and ASLR uh, disabled for this. So I'll just jump on. Okay, so this is basically my Kali Linux interface that I'll be using uh, for this uh, uh, practical demonstration. Uh, the IP of the Kali Linux machine, as I'll be showing here, is uh 192 168.11 and the target machine uh which is a windows machine i'll be showing the ip of this is 192 168.100.12 and we can as we can see uh using the netspat command um uh, uh mini share which is the uh, this one uh, the vulnerable executable is running on port 80 as I've run the netstat command and we can see here, it's running on port 80. So let's uh, go ahead. Okay, so basically the first question we need to ask ourselves is how are the bugs found in applications? So how are, they, how are these vulnerabilities discovered in the first place to go ahead with? So there are three main ways of identifying the bugs in applications. Uh, the first way is when you have the source code of the application. When you have the source code, source code review is the easiest way to identify identifying bugs by identifying the coding errors in the source. So that will come in the first position. Uh, uh, the second way is uh, if the application is closed source, we will have to apply reverse engineering to find these bugs. Third way is Applications have input points. So basically, we first identify the input points, send malformed data to these input points, and observe unexpected behavior of the application. This process, like this process of sending malformed data to the input points and, and observing the unexpected behavior of the application is called fuzzing. Uh, the unexpected behavior shows the application is not filtering any inputs correctly and may be vulnerable to like a buffer overflow vulnerability. Uh, okay, so let's, um, let's uh, we will take, uh, we will look at an example of a, simpl uh, of a simplified fuzzing scenario that will exploit a buffer overflow vulnerability on Minishare version 1.4.1, which is a free float FTP server. Uh, the webinar will cover the steps to exploit the buffer overflow vulnerability uh, in the HTTP uh, GET request uh, for Minishare 1.4.1. 1. 
So I'll go ahead and show you the fuzzing script that I have written. Uh, and also point to note, uh, not only the get method is vulnerable to uh, the buffer overflow for Minishack 1.4.1, uh, uh, the, the head and post methods are also uh, vulnerable. The difference is uh, minimal, though both uh, are exploited in almost the same way. So you can go ahead and experiment with that as well. Um, so the vulnerability lies uh, when an attacker can send an overly long get HTTP request through which he can gain control of the target system. So we will now um, look at this uh, Python script that will first the get request for us. Uh, the script starts with, uh, uh, with uh, by importing the network socket module, uh, which is present in this line. And um, the script um, also shows these lines, uh, which are uh, responsible uh, for creating a buffer array with uh, increasing buffer sizes. So um, this lines create um, a buffer array of increasing um, buffer sizes, which will be part of the HTTP uh, get request. So, and uh, so basically what's the result of the script? Uh, yeah, so um, the result is that a script uh, is the script uh, repeatedly connects to the mini share FTP server attempting to send uh, uh, attempting to send growing lengths of buffers as the HTTP uh, get requests, which will cause the uh, vulnerable application to crash at any point. So you can uh, go ahead and like just uh, I'll show, show it to you once again. So this is the basic script that uh, the skeleton script that we'll be uh, changing and uh, throughout this uh, demonstration yeah the script has been developed by me it's a very basic python script uh, uh, it's very easy to use and uh, it can be easily changed uh, for a demonstration of this uh, buffer overflow vulnerability okay let's go, uh, go ahead uh, so now that the um, mini share of 1.4.1 um, fuzzer is ready um, let us examine um, let, let us run it actually against the um, mini share instance. Uh, I'll start by making sure that the mini share instance is up and running. And we can also start the debugger and make sure that the running process is attached to it. So here I'll go. I'll just start it up and I will start the immunity debugger as well. And I'll make sure that the running process is attached. And this is the simple step. You can go to file, attach. Uh, find your mini shared instance, which is located right here, as I've highlighted on the screen. And we can just press the attach button and it'll open up in memory, like the various, uh, when we attach a process to immunity, it first is in the pause state. So we need to um, press the play button here to release it and get it uh, in a running state. Um, and also to improve the font set, uh, we can right click at any part that where we want to include it, uh, like um, improve it and go to appearance here, present here and uh, the font. So basically I've kept it in this format so that it is visible for everyone so that they can see uh, clearly. And also you can change the font of the dump by right clicking the same way and going to uh, going to font and I've kept it at uh, the same format. So you, it's visible for every so let's go ahead so now that the uh, debug process is is uh, i put it in a running state so now now that the debug process is up and ready to go we can run this um, fuzzer against this process uh, so i'll be using the command python fuzzer dot py and press enter. So as we can see, the fuzzer sends larger and larger get requests, which increases by 100 bytes each time uh, to the mini share server on each try. And until, uh, so it keeps sending large requests until um, a buffer length of around 1,800 um, characters long. Immunity, um, 
we we will see that when it uh, reaches 1800 uh, what exactly happens see you have, guys have to wait for like around 30 seconds they should be good to go so it's just sending uh, it's fuzzing and sending get requests um, with a longer get request each time to see if this uh, like so basically we are trying to uh, observe the unexpected behavior from the application that's when we know if it's like vulnerable to a basic vulnerability so it's um, still fuzzing and so until we reach a buffer length of around 1800 characters long immunity should and here so immunity pauses like as we have uh, pauses and says that the debug program has raised an exception so it's um, raised an exception when executing one uh, 41 41 41 which is a in hexadecimal which is basically capital A's in hexadecimal uh, as you can see that the uh, registers like the registers here contain um, the user supplied input which i basically in my fuzzing script which i'll be showing you now i've supplied capital a's uh, multiple uh, in a fuzzing script so it overrides the extended instruction pointer it overrides the esp as we can see we can follow this and see uh, uh, that it's been overwritten with capital a's and also the ebx has also been uh, written with uh, capital uh, a's uh, so just what you wants so you can see that it gives the error message saying that the server crashed with a buffer length of 1800 uh, characters long and if we see the buzzer again we can see that we have sent multiple uh, 41s which is basically capital a in hexadecimal 41 is capital a in hexadecimal and we can see that uh, it has overwritten almost um the eip the esp and the ebx so an important point to note here is that the eip controls the execution flow of the application and we might be able to divert the execution flow to a place of our liking such as a place in memory where we can introduce our own code see uh, the eip has been overwritten by the 41s that we have supplied as user input so if we manage to craft our buffer carefully and embed some malicious code in it, we can have the program redirect this execution towards this embedded code and execute the code of our choice. Let's see uh, how we can proceed from here towards developing an exploit for this vulnerability. So let's close the debugger here and restart the Minishare service. We restarted it and let's go to immunity and just get acquainted with this step of attaching the mini share uh, process to the immunity debugger so it's right here we press attach and again we can see it's in the pause state so we play it yeah so let's go back uh, the f um, so the fuzzer that uh, discovered that the mini share version 1.4.1 1. uh, 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 get HTTP request buffer overflow vulnerability and we have seen that a get request of around 1800 bytes creates this buffer overflow as highlighted um, earlier uh, allowing uh, this um, get request basically uh, corrupts the memory and we can also gain execution control of the mini share program the first task of exploit development is to write a simple script that will replicate this crash without having to run the fuzzer each time. So we don't have to keep running the increasing HTTP GET request. Uh, we can just uh, write a fuzzer that will uh, replicate this crash. This, uh, this script will allow us to make changes in the skeleton script and observe them with more ease in the debugger. This script creates uh, this base, this script creates a buffer of 1800 a's which i'll be uh, showing you we i'm just going to be putting more a's in um, for the sake of padding so uh, 
is so and yeah so this will be the script that will replicate my uh, that will replicate my crash um, and i'll send it to the uh, mini shared ftp server as a get request uh, let's uh, attach the mini shared executable which i think uh, i've done that already and i will uh, be uh, i will be sending the script as a get request and see if it replicates the crash so i'm going to be running the script using the same pipe Oh, let me just think that's good. Okay. So Python, the script name, um, 192.168. This is the IP address of the Windows machine, uh, which and the mini shared executable, which is running on port 80. So we can see uh, on running the script, we can see it's given as a error message uh, saying it's crashed. And on going to the um, immunity debugger, again, we can see that uh, the EIP has been overwritten with uh, 41s. And also the EBX and the ESP has been written with uh, capital A's as well. Uh, considering that the uh, EIP register controls the execution flow of a program, getting control of this register is highlighted. Uh, if, is an important aspect of exploit development. A cycle as these four bytes of the A's uh, in the um, in the fuzzer that we sent around uh, 2,200 A's. These four bytes, which I've highlighted, uh, end up overwriting the uh, EIP register. So it is vital to locate the position of these four uh, A's. Uh, in the buffer. So out of the 2,200 A's that I've sent, seeing the program here, 2,200 A's that I've sent, it is vital to locate the position of these uh, particular four A's that override the EIP as the EIP uh, controls the execution flow of the uh, program. So an easy method of identifying the position of these four bytes is to send a unique string of like around 2200 bytes like um, uh, of, rather than just A's we can send a unique string of 2200 bytes then we note the uh, four bytes uh, that write the EIP and locate the position of these bytes in the unique string so I'll close this again and go through the same process of starting it and attaching it So how do we uh, how do we um, create this unique string? So we have a utility, um, a, a useful utility for generating such unique strings. Uh, in uh, is is the uh, is a tool called the Ruby Pattern Create tool, which is located in this. If you want to note it down, user share metasploit. Exploit framework, tools, pattern, create dot rb. Okay. So user um, share metasploit framework tools pattern create dot rb and we want a length of around uh, 2200 or we can keep it at 1800 if you like. So here. Uh, just uh, hold on for a second. I'll just uh, I'll just pause it for one second. Just going through that directory. You pause. Is it paused? One second. Okay, uh, we just uh, search for it manually. Uh, I'll just be pausing it for a second here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just give me a minute.
Okay, we can start again. Okay, guys. Okay, uh, sorry for that. Uh, I'll be continuing. Uh, it's not a small part here that uh, I should have included. So that is user share. Uh, Metasploit framework tools exploit pattern create uh, and we'll be uh, creating a pattern length of around 1800 so I'll just uh, I don't know why this Oh, well, um, so, so, so sorry for being slow. Okay, um, uh, it, um, irrespective of any uh, problems that I'd encountered, I'd already created um, um, this uh, unique pattern and I'll be showing that to you right now. So you can see uh, nano uh, uh, and I'll be opening up the script here. So uh, using that uh, thing, um, using that uh, tool that's uh, that I'll be showing in a minute. Yeah, it's right here. The uh, user share Metasploit expert, uh, expl uh, Metasploit framework tools exploit uh, pattern create okay so sorry my bad was doing a small error in that i was putting hyphen instead of an underscore so here goes so you can see that uh, this will create a unique string with none of the four bytes being the same as the previous four bytes which will help us identify the string uh, which will help us identify which exactly which four bytes exactly override the um, EIP. So here you can see it's created um, a unique string with none of the four bytes being uh, similar to each other. So uh, I'll be showing that to you in a script which I have put in here. So this is the script. You can go through it, and uh, it's basically just included in the buffer the get request the buffer and uh, the HTTP request and the same connection as we uh, go ahead. So I'll be sending this using Python again, Python EIP cater and uh, 192 dot 12 480. So I'll just confirm that this is running. Okay, it is and here. Yeah. It's crashed again, and we can see that uh, uh, an exception is again raised, and the EIP is overwritten with these four uh, exactly these four bytes. As we can see, um, uh, these four unique bytes, as we can see. Uh, yeah, so we'll use these four bytes. Just give me a minute. Second, I'll just continue. Yeah, so we have these four bytes that we'll use, and uh, so how do we identify which exactly are these four bytes th that we sent in the unique buffer that is going to uh, uh, that's going to override override the buffer that we want? So we'll copy these four bytes. Four three three six six eight four three. Four three three six six eight four three. And we'll write it down here. Four three three six six eight four. Six six eight four three. Okay. So we'll use uh 
So, and uh, now that we discovered the unique four bytes in the buffer that override the EIP, we just need to find them in our um, unique um, buffer. So we use the companion tool for offset um, create, which is off pattern offset to discover the exact position of these bytes. These four bytes are located at an offset of, so we use the uh, tool like uh, this. So to discover where these four bytes are exactly located, this one, we'll, the original length that we sent, Q, and we will paste this address in. Mind you that this address is the exact one that has uh, overwritten the immunity as we can see. And on pressing enter, We, we see that these four bytes are located at an offset of 1,788. Uh, 1, um, so let's use this information uh, to uh, form a new modified buffer string and see if we can control the EIP register using the skeleton exploit. So I've written this code as well. So it's called EIP validator. So we send the A's. So basically, the buffer is modified to reach 1788 A's, which will reach the location in the buffer which overrides the EIP, and, and the four B's, uh, which will be the bytes that override the EIP itself. So we should be ex expecting 42 four times, which is hexadecimal for capital B, overwriting the EIP, and then pad the rest of the buffer with C's. So let's run it. Just change this. And uh, we have to go through the motion of uh, restarting uh, this again uh, and attaching the process to it because it crashes each time we send the send our overly long get request. So here, here goes. And release it and once we run this we again see a crash and on going to the um, uh, EIP register we can clearly see that it raises an exception and has been overwritten by the uh, clearly overwritten by the four B's showing that the calculation that we made was correct we can now control the execution flow of the mini share program by changing these, uh, these the ones highlighted, um, by changing these four particular bytes. Uh, so now let's go to the next phase, which is shellcode um, creation. So now how do we redirect the execution flow that now that we can control the EIP register? Part of our buffer can contain user introduced code or shellcode that we would like to have executed by the mini share application. Once this shell code is in memory, uh, we can redirect the execution flow of the mini share program to the shell code. The next steps will be, um, the next steps that I'll be demonstrating uh, uh, will involve examining and preparing space for this shell code and figuring out a way to redirect code execution to it. We can follow the, as we can see at this has been overwritten by C's, which is uh, the next part as I showed right here. Okay. See, uh, we have the B's which override the EIP and the C is following it. And uh, here we can see. So if we follow the ESP register in dump, which just say follow dump, uh, uh, the dump uh, and dump the memory at that location, which is this address, we can see at the time of the crash, ESP points to this address, which ends up somewhere towards the end of our buffer. Mm, just as the capital um, C's in hex starts. So basically, there are C's, uh, sorry. These are the C's and uh, these are the contents uh, that the, um, the content that the uh, ESP register is pointing to. This happens to be the same exact spot where the capital C's begin. So the B's end, which is uh, contained in EIP, 
and the capital C's begin at the same exact spot, which can which we should consider as a convenient location to place shell code as it is easily accessible through us through the ESP register later on. So I'll be explaining a little short thing which I'll need uh, for my video here. Uh, I need my uh, presentation here again. So bad character, depending on the vulnerability type, application and protocol in use, there may be certain uh, characters that are considered bad and should not be used in the buffer, return address or shell code. An experienced exploit writer like knows how to check for, uh, check for any and all bad characters before continuing the exploitation uh, process. So an easy way to do this is by sending all possible characters from 00, 0 to FF, which um, in hex as part of the buffer and seeing how these characters are to be dealt with when the crash occurs. So these are the, um, due to this time constraint that we have here, I've already um, I've done this uh, process and uh, filtered out the three characters that shouldn't be sent, which include uh, the null byte, which is uh, used to terminate a string copy operation. So when we are especially sending strings of A's, B, and C's, we when um, the when uh, the CPU encounters like a null byte in memory, it would uh, truncate the buffer to the point where the first null byte uh, appears. So the rest of the buffer would be uh, neglected if a null byte is present in our buffer return address or shell code. The carriage return, um, which is 0D, a carriage return si uh, uh, signifies that the application the, like the end of a particular field. So basically, if we send a HTTP GET request, and in the GET request, uh, it consists of 0D in hexadecimal, it would terminate the GET request at that point. So anything further after the 0D wouldn't be considered. So we basically can't send this because the shell code might be truncated, the return address might be like hampered with, or our buffer itself might be um, um, might get mangled due to the presence of this. A carriage return. The line feed character is basically the same as the carriage return, which uh, signifies to the application that the particular field has um, is uh, reached its end and it should neglect everything further. So I'll be going ahead with the next phase after this, which is discovering the uh, space in memory. So we've already discovered the space in memory, which is um, the ESP register. So let's. Uh, uh, Let's go ahead with this, uh, ne the next phase, which is finding the jump ESP instruction. Just hold on for one second. Yeah. Let's go. Make this full screen and yeah, start. So redirecting execution. So we found a, uh, the place for the shell code in uh, the memory location. Like as we see, I'll just show it to you again. So we uh, that is accessible through the ESP register. We control the EIP registers as it has been overwritten with the Bs. We figured out what characters are allowed to be in the buffer and what not, as I just showed you the bad characters list that we've made. Um, the next task is to redirect the execution flow at the time of the crash to the shell code. So we'll place our shell code exactly at this uh, location here um, to the memory address, uh, to the memory address ESP is pointing to. Uh, the most uh, intuitive way of uh, finding this uh, memory address is to replace the beast with the address that pops up at the ESP register. So we can basically replace these 42s with, with this uh, memory address located here. But uh, this won't uh, sadly work as uh, stack addresses change often, especially in threaded applications such as Minishare, where each thread has its own reserved stack memory allocated by the operating system. So it's not possible to hard code this address to these 44s. When an application uh, runs, it is first mapped into the memory together. So how do we do this? So how do we basically find the address that makes EIP um, 
execute the next instruction that points here where we'll be placing our shell code. A more generic way to find a place that the EIP ES ESP points to at the time of the crash um, is to use like DLLs. So what are they? So when an application um, runs, it is first mapped into memory together with any DLLs, drivers, modules it may, uh, it may require. These modules con uh, contains basically extra functions and data that the program needs in order to run. We can therefore look for nat naturally occurring instructions. So basically, we can fill this space with a naturally occurring instruction such as jump ESP. So when it crashes, EI, uh, EIP points to the memory address present in ESP, which in turn contains the shell code that will give us uh, that will give us arbitrary code execution and control of this target machine. So, uh, how, um, so we can find naturally occurring instructions such as jump ESP in these modules loaded. We can jump to these addresses of these instructions instead which will have the like basic effect of redirecting the execution flow of EIP to whatever address present here uh, uh, at the time, uh, uh, like here, which contains a shell code, the sh that's the shell code uh, executes. To um, quickly get an idea of how these DLLs and modules are mapped in memory, we can use a useful third party immunity debugger script called Mona, which I've mentioned earlier, created by the Coraline team. The script is already installed in the debugger, so I will type uh, Mona modules. Yeah, Mona mod uh, modules and an extensive list from here to here extensive uh, uh, we get an extensive list of all the modules uh, that of the debug application is uh, like whatever uh, extensive list is uh, displayed we will now need to choose uh, our instruction from a module that matches a few criteria so basically as i mentioned earlier that depth aslr should be disabled so uh, the so that and also the address that the jump instruction has should not contain any bad characters so the module that uh, suits this criteria is basically this one the shell 32 module this dll does not have any uh, mem memory protect uh, protection mechanism uh, enabled this makes the exploitation process fairly straightforward as we do not have to deal with the bypass mechanisms as this is a basic exploit uh, development um, basic exploit development uh, so now that we found the mini share shell 32 dll we will have to reliably load um, load at the same address which this dll loads at the same address on each reboot so we'll, we we need to find a naturally occurring jump esp instruction and find at what address this is located at. So for that, we can use a command in Mona, this inbuilt called Mona JMP for the jump, the register that we are focusing at ESP and the module that we are going to use, which is mine uh, dash M shell 32, sorry, shell 32 dot D L L. Need to put this down and oh, sorry. So here we see, here we go. So we have uh, reached, uh, we have seen the, the this particular instruction, which consists of um, 7C, 9D, 30 and D7, which is a jump ESP uh, uh, instruction present, uh, pr uh, present in the shell 32 DLL that we can use to override the EIP register uh, that will point the um, uh, point it to the shell code that we are going to place. So let's um, restart and see uh, 7C 9D30D7. So this is the address jump ESP that we are going to use and I'll go through it of starting again. And fine, attach. Initia. So here it is, 
and attach it. I'll go back and run this. Okay, so, um, so we can see this, we can write the code for this by using nano jump ESP. And you can already see um, that I have already hard, uh, hard coded this address, but um, I have, you can see that 7C D9319F has been, um, has been written uh, in reverse as this is x86 architecture and uh, it is expressed in little Indian format. So it's written in. So in the final step of this buffer overflow demonstration, we'll be first building the pay, uh, payload that is going to be included in our exploit uh, using the MSF Venom command tool. So here I've shown the MSF Venom uh, command to build the payload using a TCP reverse shell for Windows. Uh, specifying the listening IP address, the local IP address on which we will, um, which is the IP address of this machine, the attack machine, uh, the local port on which we'll be receiving the shell, which is 4444, the uh, format of the payload, which will be in Python, as the original exploit code is written in uh, Python. As I mentioned, the bad characters that we are supposed to. Um, ignore um, uh, leave out uh, while building the exploit the architecture which is x86 uh, while the platform it is for which is windows as the um, target machine is of the windows operating system and uh, the number of iterations so once we press enter for this msf venom uses these parameters to build a payload as as we can see uh, shortly Just give me a minute. So once the shell code has been built, we copy this and paste it into our original exploit as we can see here. We paste it as I've already done it. We do not need to do it again. Uh, we then go to our Windows system. Make sure uh, that mini share has been started like we can see here as it's already been started. We can go ahead and fire the exploit and get a reverse shell of the uh, Windows operating system as we can see here. Also to note that I've already started the netcat listener on port uh, 4444. So when we exploit the uh, Windows uh, machine with mini share 1.4.1 running on it, we will get a shell of the same. Twelve, And as mini share is running on port 80, we specify the port and run it against the system. As you can see, um, the uh, system is successfully exploited and we get a reverse shell from the Windows machine. I will confirm this by uh, uh, checking the IP address of the uh, Windows machine. And here you can see we have successfully exploited the Windows uh, Windows uh, machine and uh, due to the um, by leveraging the buffer overflow vulnerability present in Minishare version 1.4.1. So thank you. I'll be taking whatever questions you have for me right now. So you can go ahead. Thank you. Uh, can you just post the question in the chat? 
uh, how can we find the bug overflows in the exe um, as a uh, so uh, there are three ways to doing this basically you can use um, you can uh, if the application code is open source you can basically review the application like open source code find the bugs in it uh, if it's closed source uh, it, it it's probably very hard to find the bug but you'll have to reverse engineer and uh, what most attackers do in real time is basically send um, uh, increase uh, like they this find the input points to the application and keep sending um, various input points of varying length and once you find um, keep sending uh, varying length input points you can uh, uh, observe the unexpected behavior from these uh, application which cause it to crash yeah so that's basically you find how you find these bugs in the exes any other questions uh, sources to learn this uh, you can um, um, SL mail uh, 5.5 is uh, the very basic one for Windows. Most of the uh, people who teach uh, buffer overflows use SL mail version 5.5. Um, and also, um, you uh, a very good tutorial that you'll find on the net is uh, 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 with um, uh, do stack overflow good. I'll just be typing that. Uh, it's do stack uh, overflow uh, stack buffer overflow good by Justin he is actually uh, his resource is really helpful in learning stack overflow as he is given a very beautiful and in-depth uh, tutorial as to how to learn uh, stack overflows and uh, um, yeah you can definitely do it with ASLR and depth enabled that wouldn't be a one hour webinar then it would be pretty long as it's a very comp it's like uh, we were just doing this to step our foot in uh, expert development and uh, this is a long um, the one uh, with uh, aslr and dep enabled is uh, is is the tricky of ones which you need a little bit of experience with expert development for it to actually work um sure you can uh, just uh, mail uh, me at my email address and i will i'll be sending you the recording of the webinar uh, any more questions anyone else if you have anything that be great be. Uh, any more questions anyone uh, so that i can answer them Okay, if there are no more, uh, what if we cannot insert padding? Um, you can uh, you can always find spaces in memory that not necessarily be ESP. In situations, you you can just uh, make it jump to another uh, location in uh, memory. So what you'll have to do is observe the registers carefully. So what what I'm trying to say is, I'll just show it to you. Uh, You'll have to uh, observe the registers carefully. Once you observe these registers carefully, you'll be uh, any of these registers. Follow them in dump. See how your uh, code is overwritten with the C's or the A's that you send, and then you can see uh, where exactly you can place it. So you you can find uh, you you don't need to exert uh, um, like put padding necessarily, but you can find other registers where you will find open space to uh, place your shell code. Uh, any any other questions? Uh, no, this is uh, this is a stageless uh, shell code that I have used. It's um, it's a basic reverse shell without any uh, stager in it. It's a sh stateless shell code that I'm sending. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so if you guys have no more questions, I'll be ending this share. Um, thank you uh, for give, sparing your time for this webinar. It was a great experience uh, uh, showing you guys. Uh, you can encode the shell code using Shikata Kanai. It's uh, MSF Venom minus E option. Uh, just type uh, dash E and you can use any of the encoders available uh, um, available um, with the MSF Venom that are default. It has plenty of them. You can study uh, 
each one which suits your situation and you can use it. Um, okay, so I'll be ending this webinar. Thank you for your time. Uh, uh, thank you, Deepak Kumar. Um, it was great uh, showing this webinar as well. Thank you. Um, it was um, great. So hopefully we'll do more webinars with uh, advanced topics. Thank you. Uh, see you guys. I'll be ending the share right now. Thank you. So in this video, I'll be uh, showing you how to leverage uh, the buffer overflow vulnerability in SL Mail version 5.5.0 on a Windows 7 uh, machine. So uh, let's start. Uh, so this is the IP of my attacker machine, which we'll be using to exploit the Windows 7 machine, which uh, has SL Mail installed on it, which is a POP3 server running on port 110. In this video, I'll be showing the final step as to how to construct the payload and how to put it in the final exploit and use it against the SL Mail server. I will not be showing all the steps covered in the webinar uh, as they are almost identical except uh, identifying the bad characters and also uh, choosing the return address. The return address is different for each operating system and has to be chosen carefully. So let's start and make sure that the SL mail server has been started as you can see in this uh, it has been started and I will also make sure that um, SL mail is running on port 100, uh, 110 uh, as you guys can see here uh, SL mail is running on port uh, 110 and also I will show you the IP address of this Windows 7 machine below it's uh, 131 so I will use this exploit as shown which is an exploit for SL mail 5.5.0 server it it consists of the payload that we have created using the following options MSF venom is used to create the payload uh, which is a reverse shell payload for Windows the local attacking machine uh, through which uh, we will uh, uh, launch the exploit the port on which we will get the shell of the target system the bad characters to be avoided and the format of the payload is in python as the exploit itself is written in python the exploit consists of a buffer of 2606 a's along with the return address for the Windows 7 uh, machine which is shown here uh, then it consists of 40 knob instructions along with the payload and uh, rest of the bees so let's just use this payload uh, on port 110 as we saw on the Windows 7 machine uh, this we do not op need to open a netcat listener on port 1337 as this uh, exploit or automatically spawns a netcat uh, shell on this port once it gets a connection so let's start So once I launch the exploit, we should be getting a reverse shell of the Windows 7 machine on which the SL mail server is hosted on port 110. As you can see, the payload is being sent and as soon as we launch this exploit, we get a reverse shell of the Windows 7 uh, machine uh, which uh, and the exploit leverages the buffer overflow vulnerability of SL mail version 5.5.0 so we can confirm it is the Windows 7 machine by checking the IP using the IP config command and once we see that we can confirm that we have got a reverse shell of the Windows 7 machine which is of the IP 192.168.131 so this concludes the webinar which uh, uh, we, we had hosted uh, to explain the buffer overflow vulnerability at a beginner level and also uh, 
uh, we also showed you two different executables that can be leveraged uh, using this vulnerability. Thank you.